Here's O'Donnell bowling to Gower. Very majestic. Almost casually majestic. Paul Annett, the bowler. Oh, superb shot. Easy cover drive, but with all the power. Australian captain in great form. I'm in the Lord's Memorial Gallery, situated behind the pavilion on this great ground. Lots of excellent memorabilia here for spectators and visitors, particularly during the ever-present rain breaks in a test match series. There's the marvellous painting of Lords by Charles Cundall, England against Australia, 1938. There's no Warner stand there, and uh, there's no tavern stand either, at Father Time still presiding over the whole thing. There's my own favourite painting, and that's uh, Mr Thomas Hope of Amsterdam, Vesuvius in the background. You can't have anything more unlikely than that. And there's Victor Trumper's Australian cap, 1909, pads of the type he wore. I guess only Bradman is regarded as a greater player in Australia than the stylish right-hander. There's the ashes, the in-memoriam notice that appeared in the Sporting Times in affectionate remembrance of English cricket, which died at the Oval on the 29th of August, 1882. Deeply lamented by a large circle of sorrowing friends and acquaintances, RIP. And the body will be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. This Jack Hobbs bat, that's uh, the one with which he made his 127th century. And also this Don Bradman's boots. Well, normally on match days, here at Lord's. I'm going past the Memorial Gallery on my way to the commentary box and David Gower, England's skipper, is branching off to the players' dressing room. We've each come to the gallery today to browse and uh, to catch up on what really has been a marvellous season. David at the moment is over there having a look at Don Bradman's boots. And it is a while since I've seen you, since the final test match and the triumph. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Very good Thank season. You. And particularly, after you and I talked at Edgbaston that day behind the pavilion when you were on your way to practice for the one-day match. Yes, I remember popping out there. It was a little bit of a sort of contrast to the, the heady euphoria, I suppose, at the end of the season. I think it's safe to say things weren't quite going my way at that stage. It was uh, looking a little black. It was a turning point in this summer, and it has been said it was when you took a catch in a one-day international at Lords. Yes, uh, it helps. Those sort of little things do help, because when things are going against you, Every little psychological plus is a bonus, and to, to catch something like that, which you would do normally, you know, 10 times out of 10, 10 out of 11, whatever, and you just sort of think about it a little bit more, and it just gives you the extra boost to think, well, things are going my way today. I've caught that, and perhaps I'll get some runs as well now. But what were you thinking when the ball was in the air? Normal, really. I was thinking mainly catch it, you know, don't run anything silly, just catch it as normal, watch it, all the things you have to think about when the ball goes many a mile up there. And that uh, psychological boost was translated into a century soon after? Yes, I think it was my day because the luck was with me. I think well, some of it was fairly streaky. I remember the ball going past the keeper a few times, having wrong-footed him. But a lot of it went off the middle of the bat as well, and that was the good part about it. And you take home the positive moments. You say to yourself, well, that's not bad. We've probably got out the slump now. You try and think positively about the whole thing. And the next time you go at the course, you use that and try and make runs properly. Test match at Headingley. Suddenly, you had both them back in the side. Didn't have him in India or in Australia but suddenly he's back in the team. What about that? Um, well, I mean, you couldn't leave him out, could you? There's no way that I could leave Ian out. He's been such a tremendous force and a help to English cricket over the last few years. And his form for Somerset in the early part of the season had been tremendous. His batting was certainly electric. He hadn't taken many wickets for Somerset at that stage, I don't think. But he's always a vital part. There's no way I could leave him out. I think people were worried, or were, I don't know why, but they were worried that he might, um, what? snarl up the, the team spirit that we've built up in India, which is totally unjustified. Ian is a team man. He does some strange things or he does some unique things, all to his credit. But he, he's not going to go against team spirit as such, and he just fitted in again, as he always has done before that. And Tim Robinson? Made a big difference, that's right. His runs really made the difference, to say, between, what, 400 and 500 plus, which gave us the very vital first innings lead. Lovely square cut again. Really has uh, played that shot extremely well. One more to Robinson, takes him on to 87.
Good shot for four. Tim Robinson. He's taken full advantage of anything around about the leg stump. He's gone to 97. Yes, well, while Tim Robinson does like the ball on the offside, he can also play on the leg side. And this was a beautiful shot through the midway cam. Just leaned on it, timed it beautifully. Once again, not quite sure the bounce of it. It doesn't matter very much. He's got 100. Gone from 97 to 101 with a miscued hook. Much the same stroke as he played yesterday. A terrific performance from Tim Robinson. A century at Headingley. The first English batsman. They're going to make a century in his first test against Australia on this ground. 143 balls, he's hit 13 fours. It's his second test hundred. That's very clever play. He's waited on Thompson. Thompson's been pounding it in short, so the bouncer will get up. Robinson didn't attempt to hook that, but he played that quite decisively and de uh, deliberately away behind point. And four more. Expensive. Two boundaries and the one over. This is not the pitch where you want to be bowling one halfway down the pitch and then the next one down the leg side. It's got to be on a length and just outside off stump. It's a lovely shot. Straight drive this time. So not only on the off and the leg, but uh, strokes coming all around the wicket from the bat of the 26-year-old not so far. Lawson has worked uh, deep on leg, can't catch that. And the pearls of straying onto leg stump. You might have to keep Ian Burton tucked up, but you can't get onto his leg stump because he's very severe. Gucci's benefit here. Well, didn't get up as much as both them uh, thought it was going to. I think he probably got it uh, pretty much on the bottom edge. It still went quickly enough away to the mid wicket boundary. He's in the position very smartly. Shot. That's the best shot he's played so far. He's gone on now to 21. And Robinson is watching quietly from the other end. And I should think very happily as well. Now, there's no man down the ground for Botham when he's facing O'Donnell. The invitation is there. It's just a question of uh, will O'Donnell get one up in the slot there it is not quite in the slot but it's good enough no doubt about it uh, if it's there to be hit Ian Botham's going to hit it four runs and that's a delightful strike Say the back cut's gone out of the game. Well, those of you who think so, just have another look at that. Yes, a bit of elegance and grace there. He's been going for a big drive, but uh, there he played an absolute delightful late cut. Change of the bowling. McDermott goes off and Thompson comes on. 
It's a lovely shot. Beautifully placed through the offside once again by Robinson. And uh, he and his partner both and gave it applause. The most interesting bowling change now. Alan Borders coming on to bowl. Short, pulled away, four runs. In a feature of uh, Tim Robinson's innings, everything slightest bit offline has been very severely punished. Oh, it's a beautiful stroke again. One bounce over the ropes. Magnificent straight hit. Indeed, is the 47th boundary in this England lineage. 188 runs come with boundary shots. <laughs> Interesting little trio there. <laughs> All in their own way enjoying it. Bowler, batsman and umpire. Order to continue with his uh, slow left arm. And swept away fine, both are not bothering to run. Four more and scores a level. Four to seven to both of them. There's a few more there, that's his fifth in enormous slicks. Up onto the second balcony here, right in front of us. Oh, what a great display once again of hitting. That's a point of uh, impact there. Oh, amazingly quick 50 has come up only 45 balls, completed with a six, including another 10 fours. But, uh, Pretty difficult to set a field to IT Botham. The battle is renewed. That's helped on its way, and that's going to be six more. Tremendous shot. And this incredible players already got 60. All bowlers are light when he's in uh, the sort of mood. And he's gone, and he's gone. Dragged it on, looking to play that uh, little delicate cut shot that brought him four runs a little earlier. That will be a great relief to the Australians and a great sadness for the big crowd here because that has been magnificent entertainment by both of Bowled by Thompson for 60. And uh, another gem of an innings. The 44 for five. And the chance for the Leeds crowd to get on the feet and applaud him at those pavilion steps. And he's going to pick up another four from that. So no ball and four runs as well. And Robinson goes on to 162. Now, when he reached 153, he passed W.G. Grace in a test match statistic. At 155, he'd gone past Ranjit Sinji. And now he's made 162. And that statistic is um, the highest score in an England-Australia test match from a batsman making his debut. Pick up more runs there, and that is going to take him on the way to going past uh, Julep Sinji. And then he has ahead of him Derek Randall and Ari Foster. 
And he's gone, yes, finally take that slip. So the end of a long innings there, and quite a brilliant one from Tim Robinson. Snapped up low down at slip there by David Boone off the bowling of Lawson. And this really has been an innings to remember. Beautiful control shots, calm, collected all the way through. He never lost his cool, never got ruffled. There's 271 balls, but it for 410 minutes and hit 27 fours. That's off the edge, and it's beautifully taken. What a brilliant catch that was. Very low, very quick, and Gower is gone. Gone for only five, it's 59 for two. But, uh, a magnificent catch taken there by Border. That's got to be out. Got to be out. Moved a lot. Got the impression the way Graham Gooch grabbed his bat as he was starting off for a single there that uh, I thought he got a tickle on it as well. Well, that's a good shot. It's nothing more than a little short arm jab by Alan Lamb. 2001 runs, an average of just under 40 in 33 games. Here's Lawson now, and he's bowling to Gatting. Oh, well caught. Good catch by Wayne Phillips, and very well bowled by Jeffrey Lawson. Eighty-three on the board now for England. They need 123 in all, and they've lost four wickets. in the air and four. Not quite quick enough Simon O'Donnell to go short at both of them. And he's bowling. Well he's never looked in uh, real Botham Nick out there. O'Donnell takes his uh, third wicket. And a fairly uh, belated call for Jeff Thompson. That's his first bowl of the innings with England just 11 runs short of victory. Runs there and useful ones too, four runs. Um, on drive, well wide of uh, Lawson at the dawn. Will this be it? That's in the air, is it going to be safe? Be a good catch, we can take it, you know, he's dropped it and that's it. <laughs> They've decided, uh, yes, I don't think uh, Jeff Lawson will be very happy. All that crowd converging on him. Obviously, one eye on them, one eye on the ball. So, uh, Alan Lamb got away with it, but that one run was sufficient to see England through to a five-wicket victory after a very hard-fought contest indeed. Well, David, on paper, that Headingley victory will always look as uh, though it was fairly clear-cut, but I remember it as a marvellous match and very, very tense. Certainly was at the finish, that's right, and I think both myself and Alan Board at the start of the match we're happy to avoid, if we could, batting last on the wicket. I think we all thought it might do something to start with, but certainly batting last would be the hardest part of it. So, really, I suppose the big difference, you look in the middle of that match, having bowled Australia out for 300-odd, for us to then get 500 and a, and a good lead, thanks, I suppose, mainly to Tim Robinson's great knock, made all the difference. That gave us the leeway. That gave us a chance that if we bowled Australia out for anything reasonable again, our resulting target wouldn't be too high, which is exactly the way it worked. 
We made the most of it, as you say, it was a bit tense towards the finish there. Well, you must have been chock full of confidence when you left Headingley, but what about coming to Lords? Because 1934 was the last time England beat Australia at Lords. That was by an innings, but uh, it's a long, long time. That's right, and in the same way as I suppose history works our way at Leeds, then you come to Lords and it has to work against us. In the same way, again, you try and say, right, we've played well in the first test match, we've won that, let's keep the momentum going now, let's not let them get back at all. Unfortunately, history prevailed, I think. Um, what we did wrong, I suppose, you look at the match, it was the only time in the series that we didn't make the runs we should have done. Even having been put in on that first morning, the wicket was fine, there was no problems there for batting, really, and we should have not been bowled out for that lowest, lowest total. And had we made our, what should have been 400 plus, then obviously the game is, is nearly saved anyway. What about uh, Alan Border's innings there? Well, he played very well, I think. The, the wicket was probably at its best during the middle of the match. I think neither side would have minded batting then but we found no chink in the armour at all. He and Greg Ritchie both played very well. Whatever we did, I think, or didn't do, didn't seem to make much difference. And uh, Alan played as well as we know he can play. We always knew at the start of the series that Alan was the, the one major class batsman they had. We thought perhaps Captain Vessels as well might be another man who could make long runs, lots of runs. But AB was definitely the man to get out. Short and... That is the appropriate answer. So border on forty nine. That's it. Half century for Alan Border, the Australian captain. And how well he's played. One of the features of the Australian side this year, the applause for successful players by teammates, and especially for the captain. 71 balls, five fours, and one or two memorable shots as well. Border has that pull shot absolutely right. He just plays it straight down into the ground or lets it go, just weaves away from it. But, uh, some of the others have uh, had a problem or two with the short one from both of them. Alan Border's the one man you don't want to test with this because he's master of it. He's a he's this marvellous puller of the ball. Beautifully controlled. Here's both of them now, bowling to Greg Ritchie. Just have pitched in front of Graham Gooch. Didn't be much in it. So he's going forward as uh, well as across, and he doesn't look to be in all that good shape. Well, it carried, hit him straight on the wrist. In fact, he just went too quick down there. Just didn't quite time that. It's gone for four. Didn't get it as he might have wished. It was a pretty good bouncer from both of them. Graham Booch to Greg, Greg Ritchie. Good shot. Easily played. So nine runs up this over from Graham Gooch and the 150 coming up. Paul Allett, the bowler. Oh, superb shot. Easy cover drive, but with all the power, Australian captain in great form. Edmonds to Border. 
Well, that's an amazing catch. Now, did he hold it long enough? He surely held it long enough. And by Dickie Bird says he did not. It was an, an amazing reaction catch by Mike Gatting of the full face of the bat. I think Dickie Bird here made the right decision. The fielder never really having the ball under control. He may have been throwing it up in jubilation, but from that picture we can clearly see that he didn't really ever have control of the ball. Except, of course, that Alan Border started to, to walk, which is... Uh, there he goes. He sees the, the catch, and Border starts to walk off towards the villain, head down. <laughs> That's Perhaps nice Mike shot. Gatting shouldn't have uh, made that final desperate lunge. Edmonds to Ritchie. Fine shot. A wider ball. And Greg Ritchie. A full flow of the follow through there. A strong man, powerfully built. That was off right at the bottom of the bat. Oh, a bit of luck there. Couldn't have really have uh, placed it better. And this one, he's flashed down through those slips. He never lets one go go by. A little short outside the off, and he's after it. A 99 to Alan Border. Oh, and very nearly played that on. Well, I felt for him a bit there as a batsman who once managed to get himself yorked on 99 in a test match at Brisbane. That wasn't far off. It's an interesting over this. A cut off the bottom of the bat for four. Nearly a play on. What's next? That's it. Picked his spot very neatly, just nudged it round the corner to a long leg for the single he wanted. Up goes the bat, 100 to Alan Border. And as ever, all of his teammates on the balcony to applaud it, in addition to a very big packed house here at Lord's. 193 for four, the score, as Alan Border reaches 100 of exactly 150 balls. Ten fours in that century, and it's his 13th Test 100. His fourth of England, and his first here at Lord's. Edmonds to bowl. That's uh, just the spot you want to be, that short leg, particularly when you've been told to come in an extra two yards. When uh, the bounder decides to drop one short round about leg stump. Embry over the wicket to border. I finally got one uh, through the field. So four to Alan Border after a, a good tight spell of spin bowling from this Middlesex pair. Border now on 1-3-2. Sweep shot to follow. And that's four more. Such a long sustained spell of accuracy from uh, the off spinner. Those two successive boundaries to Border bring up the 250 for Australia. Still the all spin attack of Middlesex with Edmonds again. Oh, there's a thick edge, no slip there. A quicker ball, good piece of uh, thinking, good piece of cricket that by Edmonds, and uh, he's very, very unlucky to have given away four runs. Didn't quite time that, but it's going to race away to the boundary. Runs down the hill. And four more to border takes him past 150. Richie taking strike to Foster.
I don't think his captain would have been too pleased if uh, that had gone to hand. Just with uh, the second Newey coming along. New ball is taken now. Crucial time for both sides. Australia, six wickets in hand. England need the breakthrough. <laughs> Greg Ritchie didn't hit a boundary in the morning session. He's cracked a couple in uh, this afternoon's play. And that's fine, just wide of both of them at second slip. Four more. Richie goes to 89. And Australia go ahead of England. A lot of support there for Greg Ritchie, who's just 11 away from a century. Great joy in the dressing room this morning when Alan Border reached his 100. Foster, Donny to Border. Not where he meant, but it's good enough. Four more to border. Goes to 162. And it was his highest score in test matches. The previous one against India at Madras 1979-80. 300 up and the border record. And both of them now from the pavilion end will hopefully do the trick for David. Gower. It's been a hard struggle for England, but uh, you can't take away from the quality of the Australian batting. <laughs> and he anticipated that. It was almost ducking under it before it uh, ever appeared. Uh, at least uh, Australia lost some of uh, the composure. I think Greg Ritchie thought he was going to get stumped there, which is obviously an impossibility. And that's out this time. No question at all. Richard moved inside for that leg glance. And umpire Evans there, uh, no hesitation whatsoever. Up oh, goes the finger and Richie goes for 94. So both them strikes again to leave Australia 317 for five after an excellent partnership. Well, this is all down to both of them. Richie's moved in, think he was going to get another bouncer, got right out of position. And he's from LBW. Ian Botham once more making things happen. So the great hand uh, for Greg Ritchie from a full house here at Lords. 101 to 370, the partnership of 216. The partnership which has put Australia on top here. There it is, and he's picked that up in uh, great style. Glorious six runs over deep square by Donald. And I won't say that both of them won't mind it, but uh, he won't be as upset as some people. Three ninety-eight for six, border one ninety-six. Both of them, if anybody, certainly deserve that wicket. A handshake from uh, the two of them. The end of a fine innings. Lovely piece of bowling by both of them. And uh, Alan Border goes for 196. Beautifully picked up there, lowered slip. And it's 398 for seven. And uh, that's the sort of reception now that Alan Border will get all the way into this famous pavilion. Tremendous effort. 20 for 2 when he came in, Australia in trouble. He's seen them through to 
a very big lead at the moment and the whole England team in unison with the crowd applauding him on his way through into this Lord's Pavilion. Well, Ian Botham deserved this. He had a couple of plays and misses from Border, but the catch was good. Graham Gooch, low down, both hands. And uh, one mustn't forget the applause ringing round now is for Botham, because that means he's taken five wickets in this innings again. And that's the 25th time he's done that in a test match. No other person has uh, taken five wickets 25 times. It's his eighth time at Lord's. And that could be out. Yes, and Hulich has gone for naught. Botham's taken the wicket in the very first over. Alan Lamb taking the catch down at uh, deep square leg. And Australia needing 127 to win this test match. Have lost their first wicket without a run on the board. Ian yeah, Botham in full cry here. That's in the air, and a simple catch, and Botham's got another wicket. That gives him one pass, Bob Willis. Nine for two, Australia, and Botham has disposed of both openers now. And that's back on his mark, ready again. Oh, and he's bowling. Alec punches the air, a well-deserved victim for him. 22 for three, Australia. And the great Arichi goes, clean bowl by Paul Allen for just two. Oh, it's quick, and he's done it. Oh, God, really, very, very smart reaction there. Is pushing forward, just catching out of his gown in a flush. Gow had that ball back, hit the wicket. And it's 63 for four with Kepler Vessels running. Oh. And he's bowling. Edmonds strikes a very much deserved wicket there for Phil Edmonds. And uh, David Boone goes for just a single. It's 65 for five. And uh, still a lot of cricket to be played in this match. There's a thought uh, around that uh, Wayne Phillips might not know what a crisis is, Tony. <laughs> well, this is evidence, if you've required any. Again, picked up the length of the ball, which is a little on the short side, so quickly. And that's a good shot. It wasn't a bad ball, it was uh, certainly not short, but it just allowed Phillips enough room to play the cut. And the water must have been searching desperately for a partner. Found just the man in Wayne Phillips. Good catch. Edmonds. He's bowled beautifully this morning. That was a splendid catch. And England back in with a breath of hope again. Phil Edmonds. Well, 
the invitation was there and he hasn't mucked around with it he smashed it straight over the boundary alongside the side screen and Alan Border will have just a little half smile on his face at that and that's it O'Donnell has hit the winning runs Border has given his jump of pleasure and well he might he's played such a, a role in this victory to make certain that when the teams go to Trent Bridge that it will be all square we always thought we just didn't quite have enough leeway there we, we bowled very well and we had a great morning there that last morning in the match and certainly again it was a very very tense finish in the same way Leeds have been tense but they just again didn't have we just didn't have enough runs on the board to make them sweat quite hard enough however well we bowled well, it was a nice way to start the series anyway. You've got six test matches. Suddenly, after two, you're one all, and now you're on your way to Trent Bridge. That's right. We've all been saying at that stage and in the build-up that there were two evenly matched sides. I think the, the differences would have been that you would have expected the Australian pace attack to hold more sway, but we'd have expected our batsmen to have greater experience and greater depth. So, overall, we're still saying, and it seemed to be proved at that stage after two matches, that we had two reasonable sides, two well-matched sides, and therefore a good series in the offing. What about uh, this young fellow, McDermott, who started to bowl pretty well in that match? Well, I've been warned about him by Brian Davis, my old Leicestershire teammate, who's been playing out in Tasmania for a while now. And Craig McDermott had broken Brian's arm at some stage in the, the preceding season. So he was full of a certain amount of respect, and I've always had a certain amount of respect for what Brian says. So I was quite keen to look at him closely. He certainly bowled some very quick balls through the series, actually. He had his ups and downs. Uh, when he got it right, he bowled it straight and quick. him up and that's McDermott again we're talking about his potential what he's doing in this match is of tremendous value to Australia and now for Trent Bridge well in 1981 that was uh, a seam bowler's paradise do you have the job of uh, deciding what to do when you won the toss up there yes in 1981 I think the weather made a difference there it was uh, mainly overcast for most of the match which helped the ball to move when we got there at the start of this test match the weather's a bit better and I think there wasn't much moisture in the pitch, it mostly dried out anyway. It was certainly going to be very flat. It looked perfect for batting on in the end, I think, and that wasn't too hard a decision to make to bat. It did look at one stage as though you're going to make 650 or 700, so well, uh, with the batsman batting. Well, yes, I can make a little personal success there, I and mean, I quite enjoyed batting on it. So Donald bowling to Gower. Lovely strokes uh, of that quality down at Lords. It was uh, absolutely magnificent. And how good it is to see David Gow moving that front foot, getting right to the ball. Majestic stroke. Jeff Lawson to Gow. Good shot again. There's two glorious cover drives. From David Gower this morning. <laughs> Very majestic. Almost. Casually majestic. Silver pitch one again, and it's driven very firmly for four by Derry Gow. It really does make it the ball so easy when he's in form. Holland again to Gower. A lovely shot for Gauss 50, waited for it, placed it nicely away. So three runs to David Gauss, take him on to 52, the bat's in the air, and another test match 50 for David Gauss.
McDermott to Gower. It's an elegant stroke. All the time in the world. Shot. Pretty easy for there, the just race away of the boundary. Down the wicket, over the top, great shot. Perfectly safe. And Gal goes on to 98. Fine stroke from David Gower, using his feet, getting right to the pitch of the ball, and chipping that high over mid on. <laughs> Donald and can to come uh, round the wicket now to Gower. That's it. Nice and all. Uh, Nudge off the legs, we'll come back for two and uh, 101 then for David Gar. Fine effort, the that set high, 261 for two, and Gar uh, not out, 101. Central made up 167 balls, nine fours in it. It's his tenth test hundred, and his third, in fact, against Australia. Oh, it's a beautiful stroke. The stroke of a man in really cracking form. Brilliant shot. All the time in the world. Oh, that's another great shot on the onside this time. He rocked into position so quickly. Powered it away. And David Gow moves on to 146. Craig McDermott. It's over pitched and driven with all the ease and grace that one has come to expect. Four more. 154, David Gower. Off comes the cap. He's pushed his boundary collection on to 15 now. And he's received just 258 balls for that 150. So Bob Holland immediately going to come round the wicket to David Gower, looking uh, once again for it's a bit of rough he might find outside off stump. Well, would you believe it? It really has not been Mike Gutting's season, has it? Ball ricocheting off the bowler, Mike Gutting just slightly out of his ground, and he's got to go run out for 74 and the third English wicket goes down at 3.58. Well, really bad like that for Mike Gappy. He wasn't backing up very far, but David now hit this so hard. You see, he rocks back and he really crashes it again. And Bob Holland just gets a touch. And that's out. And this is uh, Simon O'Donnell. Okay. We're going to see him come in now from the Radcliffe Road end. Oh, well bowled. Yes, beauty. Gower goes, he gets the first one really this morning, which has lifted, taken off and moved away. Outside edge, and he goes for 166. So, immense relief to Australia to see the back of the England captain, because this has been a superb innings for him. 166 out of 365 for four. He's dominated this English batting today. And this really has been an absolute joy to watch. It was disappointing again. We had a, a mini collapse for the last well, six or seven wickets that went down for 60, 70 runs. 
And that left us, instead of being, as you say, 600 on the board and really in the pound seats, it left us somewhat short. And when two guys played very well for Australia, and that rather made a mockery of that, and it condemned the game, I suppose, to be a draw from then onwards. In fact, your collapse really started with that extraordinary incident with Mike Gatting being run out. Not the, the best way to be out, of course. I mean, you've got to feel sorry for the guy. He'd played very well, actually, and was still in the same sort of form that he'd showed throughout the winter in India, and had started off with it heading there. And for his point of view, he was very disappointed. For mine as well, because we had been going well. And of course, afterwards, things went rapidly downhill. And then, of course, you had Graham Wood and uh, Greg Ritchie, both of whom played extremely well. Yes, Graham Wood. It was a bit of a saving, saving innings for him. He'd been struggling a bit in the test matches up until then, but played very well. Never had a problem. Very controlled, very disciplined. Very good innings indeed. Greg Ritchie escaped at the, at the start of the innings, I think. He had a little let off early on. Yes, he did. Yeah. Which is, again, you look back on these things and you think, if only we'd held on to that. That's but the he, thing. He did have a little let off as well when he was caught down third man off the no ball. Yes, he'd got a few more by then, I think. And well, actually, that was one of the most exciting parts of the game. There was two or three overs that were both in bowl. I think it was electric as anything that we saw throughout the entire series. It was uh, a magnificent little period. And uh, also a bit of a challenge to you. Um, I quite enjoyed it, actually. I thought we did most things right there. I thought, um, obviously, Ian was steamed up a bit. The situation was not just electric, but a tinge explosive as well. And I thought I came out of quite well. I thought I did all the right things, spoke to the right people at the right time. Ian was still going. I said, you just get on and bowl, which he did. And he had that burst, which was a make-or-break effort, really. But you do need that sort of burst. I mean, you need people like Ian to come on, to entertain. And in this case, of course, from my point of view, to try and take the wicket. It was, let's say, the most important part about the whole issue was that it was exciting test cricket, good entertainment, exactly what players and public should be enjoying. So you've uh, gone from Trent Bridge, what you might term an honourable draw, I suppose, for both teams, and you've gone up to Old Trafford. Did you have the feeling when the Australians went into that match that uh, they were sort of looking around the weather and the thought of a draw and they hold the ashes and let's just be a bit defensive and hang in there? I think the weather started to come into it a bit more later in the game. I, think, I don't think they thought that at the start of the game. I'd be very surprised if they did. And there's still three test matches to go. We'd only got halfway through the series. There's still, you know, supposedly 15 days cricket left. Now, I mean, I certainly wasn't thinking that. I was thinking, you know, it's another chance to get ahead again. I thought it was our turn. You know, we'd had a one-one, lost one, drawn one. I thought, right, it's our turn to win one again now. What about um, Mike Gaddings batting up there? Well, oh, great. I mean, he hadn't made 100 in this country in Test cricket before. He'd played well through the first three Test matches. He got at least 150 in all of them. And as I say, his form in the winter had been magnificent. He's, he was looking good. And I was delighted to see him get it. He played very well again, I mean, 160 on that wicket, which was slowish. He played some good shots. He really dominated proceedings, actually, all while he was at the crease. Threw mid on with a fine on drive. And uh, Mike Gatton really found his touch. A long, long chase. In fact, uh, could run four if it hadn't gone over the ropes. That's four more. That's a lovely shot. Beautifully placed. Gatting goes to within four of a century. That was a lovely shot. Copybook stuff. There it is. A hundred for Gatting. He's already gone past his thousand runs for the summer. It's his first Test 100 against Australia and the first he's ever made in this country. And a nice moment to be able to be congratulated by his teammate from Middlesex, Paul Down. Mike Gatting, 100, 179 balls and 14 boundaries. A splendid innings. That's a great way to get uh, things away after tea. Half volley clipped away quite beautifully, as has been his want here all day. Four runs on the leg stump. Yeah, Sam McDonald just straying there down the leg side. 
and Mike Gatting clipping it away, picking it up without any problem at all, <coughs> just past the square leg empire. So that gives England a three-figure lead. Now 101 runs ahead. They'll be looking for another 100 fairly quickly. That's another beautiful stroke. Really flying from uh, Gatting's mat now. Clipped through that uh, vacant area between mid-wicket and mid-on for four more. Exactly the sort of acceleration that England need and this massive uh, old traffic crowd enjoy. Beautifully placed again, perfectly timed for four more. Just simply lent on that, picked the right spot and found it. Well, Mike Gatting certainly playing some classic shots here today. And another beauty there. Beautiful follow through, head perfectly still and plenty of power into the shot. So Lawson continuing to uh, peg away here. Oh, beautiful stroke. Really has played that so well here. Short outside the off stump, right on top of it, cracked it away square. Four more for Gatting. Four runs and 150 for Mike Gatting. And he's gone this time, finally at the end. A catch to the wicketkeeper at the end of a magnificent innings of 160 from Mike Gatting. 430 for six, another five wickets in an innings for McDermott. But that really has been a magnificent performance from Michael Gatton. It has been a, a marvellous comeback for him, and it really has been a, a comeback rather than uh, just a fellow coming up and making runs. Oh, yes, he's been around a while, hasn't he? That's it? right. And what, a, uh, what about the other aspect uh, of him in the series, uh, being vice-captain to you? Well, I think, again, that started in India. I think that was something which gave him Perhaps the added confidence that you know, people believed in him now, that people had confidence in him, that he could go out and do the job. And it's, he's helped me without a doubt. He's been a, a good man, sort of scuttling around behind me, thrusting ideas forward, which I can either take or leave as I wish. He's, he's, he's always a good, uh, good man to have on the field there. He's always bustling around, plenty of chirp, as they say. And he's, he's played remarkably well with it. David, a um, long, long time ago when I played test cricket, we used to have uh, lots of aggro between the two teams and a drink in the dressing room afterwards. There's been some criticism this year that there's a little bit uh, too much bonhomie between the two teams, that it just sort of slipped past that competitive edge. Um, well, I, I don't think you can really criticise people for getting on well together. As you say, the, the idea is that on the field everything is hard and off the field everything is friendly. And I think we, we stuck to that by and large all the way through the series. And I can certainly remember one or two hard words have been spoken at times under pressure on the field, which uh, has always been against Australia, which I quite enjoy. And I think I'd miss it if it wasn't there. And I know, for instance, that um, our guys were certainly competitive enough. And I can tell you that their bowlers were certainly competitive enough and we were batting. So there was no shortage of, of competition, no shortage of aggro, really. But as you say, it was a very, very good tour from the point of view of getting on off the field. And I can remember you and um, Ian Botham and Alan Border on a couple of occasions, one at uh, Old Trafford. Um, just helping the crowd along, keeping them happy? Well, yes, I mean, the three of us have played a lot of cricket together and against each other over the years. And I, mean, I remember my first tour to Australia, 78-9, was Alan Border's first tour or first test match in Australia. He's a genuinely good, good man, a nice friend to have, and that applies to a number of the Australian side, a number, to our, a number of our side. Although there were some new faces, probably in both, I think by the end of the tour, virtually everyone knew everyone else. Well, now, Alan Border managed to hang on there and in the end they did it with a little bit of style, but still, one all as you go down to Edgbaston, out to toss with Alan Border. What was the atmosphere like that morning? Well, I always find that the first morning of a test match is fairly special anyway. Everyone's a bit nervous. No one knows what's going to happen next week in a battle bowl. Everyone's got that sort of expectant air about them, including the crowd, of course. And I suppose I was a little bit more nervous as well again, having made up my mind on going out to toss that we're going to put them in, which always has its risk, as we know. So it was an interesting time to be around. 
What about uh, the first morning? Because nothing actually went for you in that first session. No, that's right. I mean, they ended up looking quite comfortable and not much happened really. So again, it always gets to the back of the mind, like, have we done the right thing or, you know, are we now struggling a bit? But again, we came back well because having, having let them get to, I don't know what it was, but the first three or four wickets, having batted well, we then inspired a minor collapse, looked in a good position again, sort of 250, 260 for seven, which I was quite happy with until, of course, Lawson played well, aided by McDermott and Thompson. So they, they got themselves back into a, a reasonable position again by the end of the second day. And the weather had intervened those first two days until um, I suppose you might have looked at it from the dressing room and wondered if once again you might have been cheated. Well, that's right. I mean, you, when you are running out of time, every second seems precious. And we set off, I suppose, that Saturday morning. Started, everything started brilliantly. I, mean, I ran out Lawson. He hadn't woken up yet, I don't think. <laughs> and then we got Holland out straightforwardly straight after that. So this has been a fine stand. And Ellison is a man who is going to attempt to break it. Had a marvellous uh, spell yesterday. Coming in for the first ball of the third day of this Cornhill test. And through for a quick single, Gauss onto it quickly. And it's a good throw and he's out. And it's a sensational start to the morning's cricket. Well, Gauss had a good day in the field. He's taken a brilliant catch yesterday and now responsible for a lovely pickup and accurate throw. And Lawson, who played so very, very well here yesterday, has gone to the very first ball of the day. Run out for 53, making Australia 335 for nine. Oh. Ellison then to Holland. And that's out. Beautifully taken. A third catch to Phil Edmonds. A sensational end to that uh, innings. It's all over in the space of an over. And uh, Richard Ellison finishes with uh, six wickets. Bob Holland goes, as they say, without troubling the scorers to leave Australia 335 all out. So we'd, we'd done everything right for five minutes. And from then on, things looked good. We batted very well that day. And it's one of those days where, at the end of the day, people say, well, look, that was very well planned and you know, England did all the right sort of things. To me, it just seemed to happen naturally. I think we, we got off the right sort of start. We were batting on a good wicket. The bowling was a little erratic. We just played well and it came naturally. And without having to think about it, without having to plan it, we did all the right things we needed to. No third man, and that'll be four. Hundred and thirteen for one now, forty-nine to Robinson and thirty-three to Gower. There's the half century for him. Once again, that ball ran about Robinson's pads. And once again, he deals with it. It's a good uh, straight drive. Beautifully placed by Gar. So the 100th partnership comes up for the second wicket. Uh, taking his score on to uh, 47 and Tim Robinson on 60. Lawson to Robinson. That's short, and that's four runs. Jeff Thompson now coming on at the city end, taking over from Madonna. It's a cracking shot from David Gare. Didn't quite time it, as he would have wished. It got down towards the middle of the, uh, the uh, bottom of the bat. Oh, I don't know if they're ever going to learn. Thought there were enough boundaries have been hit today by Robinson to indicate that that is very much his strength. And there's an air of good humour around with England carrying the attack right on to Australia. Don't bother chasing that.
on. Rattle the way to the boundary. 100 to Tim Robinson and a very, very good one as well. No doubt about that. Brilliant stroke. What a nice way to bring up the century. 193 balls, 12 fours. None of them better than that last stroke and 273 minutes. Thompson de Gaulle. Beautiful stroke. That's one for the memory. And even the bowler is clapping. Clapping the stroke and the century. As Gaulle has gone on now to 101. Well, David Gaulle won't play a much better shot than this. And what a way to go to your century. Perfect for the drive. Thompson de Gaulle. Pretty to watch. And a nice way to bring up the thousand first class runs in 1985. Super shot. This is McDermott. And what's through mid off for four runs? And even without the slope, they can't uh, block all the gaps. And then the applause there for the 250 partnership. Still to be Holland. He's picked that one up with a swing out towards long on. Has it cleared? Yes, up there, the two arms aloft. It's six runs to David Gar. I just have a feeling that David Gar has been waiting for that one. Pick that up beautifully. He's gone for another one. Crack the straight and a fine stroke for four this time. 300 goes up. Gow puts on the pressure. Four more wanted for the 150. There's some quite incredible shots in the last uh, 20 minutes. That takes him to 150. I don't know whether you call it a cut or a drive. Somewhere between the two. But it found the boundary edge and it's 151 out of 331. Remarkably good innings. Yes. a bad ball as Hollow comes back short outside the off stump crashed through the offside by Gower and it's four again. <laughs> 337 England have gone ahead. Thirty-eight means that this pair now have added exactly three hundred runs. Long, long time since Graham Gooch went for nineteen when the total was thirty-eight. A magnificent stand for the second wicket. He's now gone on to exactly three hundred. Twenty for this big edge-busting crowd to cheer about. Not too often do you get three hundred stands. Dermot, but uh, Jeff Thompson is going to be given this final over. And let's face it, he's taken all the wickets that have gone down today. One for 72. 
was a no ball. One more ball in the over. Sliced away down the third man. And sufficient to uh, see him look past the 350 mark. 351 just for the loss of Graham Beach. Rounded off the day with an absolutely glorious extra cover drive. Couldn't see anything much better than that. Well, I watched a lot of cricket over the years, played in a bit, but I did write back to Australia in a series of articles on the Friday night that providing Australia didn't do anything particularly stupid, there's no way in the world they could possibly lose that match from the position they were in after the tail enders had fought back. Mm. It's interesting because you look back at, say, the previous two test matches, played again on slow, flat wickets, good for batting. And it just emphasises, really, that even under those conditions, you've got to play well, you've got to bat well, the runs still have to be made. And the work that went into those two previous test matches set us up in many ways for this one at Edgbaston. And when things went right, and we did inspire the odd collapse and have the Australians reeling, then you see the benefit of the hard work that's gone before. So you got through Saturday with an absolute slaughter. You really did uh, give them a tremendous caning. I think it's true to say that uh, they didn't bowl very well, but you're only allowed to bowl as well as the opposition permits, and you didn't permit uh, too much good bowling there. When you got through to the Monday and Tuesday, was this going to be it? Well, yes. I mean, we, the problem then, or yeah, the thinking then, was well, when to time the declaration. And you, know, you get all sorts of opinions floated at you by various people. You just have to sit down and work out your own best options. More there. Three twenty-eight. Now this uh, stand is worth. So the uh, figures of three hundred partnerships for England have now gone ahead of Hobson Rhodes against Australia in nineteen eleven twelve. And it's gone. Well, this wicket finally goes. Robinson is bowled, uh, played it on there. Just too short of his 150. But a uh, marvellous effort that from Tim Robinson. Another big 100 to add to those he's already made. 148, it's 369 now for two. And Robinson bowled a Lawson for 148. Dermot again to Gower. That's four. And loose delivery there from McDermott. No problem at all to the England captain. Just stroked it away so nonchalantly. This is Jeff Lawson, and uh, he's bowling to Mike Gaddy. Well, it's rather nice that Gatting should play a stroke of such quality to bring up a real milestone in uh, his cricket career. He's now scored a thousand runs in the calendar year from November the 28th last year. No doubt about that. Glorious extra cover drive from uh, David Gower. Brings him past the 200 mark. Come back for the third. David Gow goes on to 202. A magnificent innings, his best in Test match cricket. Just uh, looking past his previous 200 here, which he made against India in 1979. And a very popular double century, this. Crowd on their feet. Alan Border nodding his congratulations. Mike Gatting shaking him warmly by the hands. A six and twenty-five fours in it of 285 balls, and that's a good scoring rate. Well, <laughs> now for Mike Gatting and. Uh, Come quite a good deal closer for him. There's nobody back there for uh, Gatting. It was again another beautiful shot.
Well, it's taken a long time. Pat of congratulation there from Jeff Lawson to David Gower. As Gower goes out, court forwarder Bol Lawson. Lawson now has taken two of the wickets and Gower has made 250. 463 for three. And England captains against Australia. Five of them have made uh, centuries over the years and Gowers is the second highest score behind only Wally Hammond. Here's the dismissal, short outside the off stump and he cracked it square straight at Allen Border. Great shot for four. That's the first time England have ever made 500 at uh, Edgbaston against Australia. What about that? <laughs> that is quite incredible. Quite incredible. First ball, bunk for six. I just decided to get his eye in there, straight into the pavilion. Uh, incredible, really. Ball of McDermott's pace, and the first ball goes straight in the pavilion. Yeah. And there's another one. Six more to follow. This is absolutely incredible. Well, he obviously got his eye in with that first six because that went about another 10 or 15 yards farther than the first one. But what a perfect finish. Complete follow-through. And two marvellous big sixes out of the first three balls received. He's crossed out of the way on the leg side this time. Six six four. What a way to greet the Premier fast bowler on the opposition side. And that's another great hoik out to deep square, and he's been beautifully taken. What a good catch that was. So both them sacrificing his innings to try and push the score along, but a tremendous catch out there by Jeff Thompson. Not an easy one. Hit high, swirling away. And McDermott is delighted that Sanders finally grabbed a good catch off him. So a disappointment of the crowd, but uh, both them unselfishly not worried about averages. He's come there to get some quick runs. He got 18, as you can see, quickly. Two sixes and a four in it and fell to that catch. The deep square leg boundary. And it's through. And there's the single that uh, he wanted. He's got a hundred, he's kept running because that is the declaration. Everything is really going so much our way that you had to think, yes, this is the moment. And uh, he had it in the back of the minds that you know, we're definitely going to win this one. We'd been close at the, in the previous match at Old Trafford. We thought, well, this has got to be our day. Did you think that uh, they might have been down enough to produce a batting collapse, such as the one that did actually happen? Well, you know, I'd like to sort of think of it more positively from our point of view. You'd like to say, well, we're up enough that we're going to make them struggle. What about Hilditch? Well, <laughs> I mean, thanks very much indeed is, is the way you feel about that, isn't it? You set him up for the hook, and uh, I mean, it's Ian's, Ian's always going to be a great one to bowl in that sort of situation. So he loves doing that sort of thing, even if it goes wrong. And when it works like that, it's a dream. That's out. No need for the batsman to wait for the umpire. Flash outside the off stump. And Ellison strikes. The Vessels goes for 10, and it's 32 for 2. 
Yes, Warrison looking to move the ball in, but on this occasion, he swung it out, but it was a bit wide, and uh, Kepler Vessels will be a bit annoyed with himself there. Right, watchman uh, Bob Holland has 25 minutes to survive out there. And these uh, England bowlers and fielders will be right on their toes now. Three slips, two gullies. Now listen to Holland, who's on the mark. And his LBW first ball. <laughs> so Ellison's on a hat trick, and the ploy of sending in the night watchman once again hasn't worked. 32 for three, Australia. Now, well, certainly Bob Holland getting his foot on the wrong line here. You can see his foot goes right down the line of the stumps. That ball pitched around middle and straightened and would have hit about middle. So Holland Border having to come in in the end at 32 for three. So at 32 for three, Alan Border finding himself on the hat trick. But, uh, he's in no hurry. Alison Thunderbird. Another very good hat trick ball. With a little bit of width. And Border to experience a campaigner to be drawn out there. Alison again to Wood. A slobbed in the air, gentle. Anybody going for it? Oh, the word, yes. A long delay there. So Robinson finally moving in, taking the catch, and Ellison now is taking the three wickets out of the four that are down. 35 for four. Dramatic collapse here at Edgebuston as Wood goes for ten. Ellison drawing Wood into playing on the leg side, and the ball slightly an outswinger to him, went straight up, and he was up for a long time, and nobody looked to be going to go for it, but eventually Tim Robinson came running in, and you can see... He's almost on the wicket before he, uh, in fact, caught it. And probably half a dozen people could have caught it, but uh, nobody looked too keen for a while there. <laughs> oh, no, a few bowlers who would have been rush rushing after that one. Well, what about that? Border goes, clean bowl by Ellison, 36 for five. Real drama. And that could well be the final clinch bin there. A very sad, dejected Australian captain there. Well, this might be the ball that decides the match. Richard Ellison bowled very well indeed, and for instance, the ball that uh, bowled border. I mean, that's the sort of time when you know that AB is the man to get out. You know that he's frustrated us, for instance, at Old Trafford in the game before and got another 140 play very well. To bowl him like that was, again, one of those major, major parts of the game. What about Ellison's method? It's, it, to me, it's delightfully old-fashioned in that he just runs up, bowls a good line length and swings the ball. Well, yes, he does it very well. It's a question of putting it in the right place as well. And he's, he's improved a lot over the last year. He's bowling a bit quicker now than, for instance, he was in India. He's a bit more aggressive than he was. He's obviously not a quick bowler as such, but he, he does make the batsman think. Apparently he shouldn't really have played in that match. He wasn't fit enough, but... According to Bernard Thomas, he was going to be a risk, but according to Richard, who knew full well the risks and the, the responsibilities on him, he said he'd get through, and I believed him, and I'm very glad I did. Well, he got through for you, all right, and he took you through to the Tuesday morning when, mm. uh, the moment we arrived at the ground, the covers were over and the rain was coming down, and the forecast, if I remember it correctly, was absolutely deplorable. It wasn't very good. Um, we had various forecasts from breakfast telly, from the local Met office, which seemed at variance at times. And it, we were told at some stage it was clearing in the afternoon. So we knew or thought we, we were going to have some cricket at some stage. It did seem to drag on. There was some fairly useful banter. I mean, the dressing rooms being right next door to each other uh, at Edgbaston there, and AB was sat there quite casually dressed and just looking forward to the rain coming down all day. And one or two words flew between us now and again, all, all in good humour. Then, of course, we got out in the field, uh, came back again two minutes later, bad light and rain and drizzle, and it took us really a very frustrating long time to get out there to, to really get into it again. 
But once again, when you did get on the field, the bowling was, uh, I thought, as good as anything we saw in the whole of the summer. Yes, we started off and, in fact, Phillips and Ritchie again played well. They, they looked in charge. We had, obviously, very attacking fields. So the runs were no longer really a problem. And they played well. They obviously picked up a few runs, hit the ball hard. And the seamers weren't getting very far. The spinners then had to have a go. And, of course, we ended up with the, the turning point of getting Phillips out, caught via A.J. Lamb's boot and into my hands. <laughs> Well, he's done him. <coughs> but will it be given out? It'll need some consultation. Umpires would need to have been eagle-eyed. I couldn't see what happened. It'll need to be something on the replay. Empire Shepherd has given him out. And Phillips is distraught, and Ritchie at the other end is equally distraught. Well, whether it's disappointment at the way he got out or not, is difficult to tell. But here's the shot. He crashes it down into a boot. And David Gar turns around and picks it up. I don't honestly think there was any question that that wasn't out. Well, that was uh, a desperately unfortunate dismissal for Wayne Phillips, who'd played so very well. And my ageing eyes still are not quite good enough to see precisely what happened there, but uh, it didn't seem to me that there was uh, any point in worrying about it anyway, because it's no different from being caught behind. The umpire says, OK, mm. that guy's out. Well, and and to, be, to be fair to all concerned, I think the decision was totally right. Mm. And you, you talk yeah. about, uh, for instance, the benefit of the doubt. There was no doubt in David Constant's mind. He had a clear view. There was no doubt, for instance, in the fielders, in the minds of the fielders stood opposite, i.e. short leg, the keeper, slip. Those that are in the right position to see could tell you quite categorically that uh, the ball was nowhere near the ground. I couldn't tell it because I was halfway, yeah. halfway turned anyway, just turned back in time to see the ball looping towards me. But I think it's, it's certainly an unfortunate dismissal from the batsman's point of view. He's done very little wrong, of course. He's hit it, hit it hard and down, and it's, it's only just been deflected upwards. And he's gone this time. Well, he played uh, pretty well. So Greg Ritchie goes to 20. And Embury takes his first wicket of the match. Yes, good piece of bowling this a little bit of flight Richie pushing forward and there's just one thing I'll say about that which is very good to see is that Greg Ritchie didn't hang around he knew he'd hit it and he was on his way straight away which is very sporting and he's gone <laughs> There we go, I'm going to ball out there, Edmonds take the wicket, Lawson goes, it's 120 for eight, and England nearly home. This, of course, an absolutely vital match for England to win, put them on ahead in the series, and uh, Australia then would have to win at the Oval. And just a little bit of turn and stop, and pushed into David Gow, who's very, very close there, and he did extremely well to clutch that in there. The consultation means that Edmonds comes off after his two wickets and both of them comes back. With a Donald down there, uh, this could be slightly more interesting. Might have been in David Gow's thoughts that uh, both of them has got rid of a Donald three times in the series. And it bowled him. So both of them's done it again. Ball of full length, and O'Donnell hitting all round it. He goes for 11. 137 for nine. It also establishes a record for both of them. Yet another one. It's most wickets taken by an Englishman against Australia. 129. 
Yes, Ian Burke again. A little bit of in-swing there. And just finding the gap between bat and pad. So the last two Australian batsmen at the wicket. One, 37 for nine. Both are in. And his goat, caught at short leg by Edmonds. Botham's done it again, 142 all out. And England winning a test match, a thoroughly deserved victory. A game in which they've outplayed Australia with bat, with ball and in the field. Edmonds uh, has picked up, I think, about four catches in this test match. They've all been pretty good ones. And this, the one that mattered most of all. Edmonds, a very good, a very safe pair of hands. So, victory by an innings and 118 runs for England to go 2-1 up in the series with just the final test to come at the Oval. What about the euphoria in the dressing room then? Did this seem as though you were so far ahead now, even though it was only 2-1, that they wouldn't catch up? It was good news in the dressing room, for sure. It's, it's always one of those situations where, from my point of view, I end up on top of the pavilion somewhere dealing with the press. And you tend to come back about 45 minutes later to find all the champagne's gone. But uh, the feeling was certainly good. I mean, you take time straight away to say, well played. And you know, people know they've done well. It was a great victory. And you know that after all the pressure of the weather and the previous games and the hard work that has gone in, when you do win that and you end up, as Peter West would say, dormy, with that one to play at the Oval, you know you're in a good position. So it's quite a pleasant feeling. Well, fortunately, Ian Botham was fit. Had to get through uh, a fitness test, but uh, I shouldn't think anything could have kept him out of the game. And you come into the Oval, last test match, 2-1 in the lead, and I should think, uh, apart from being a little nervous, very, very happy. Well, yes, that's right. It was, it was again, a magnificent atmosphere that morning, the first match of the day, first day of the match. And it's one of those times you get that sort of glory feeling, you, you get to just rub it in now. You know, it's, uh, it's time to put the icing on the cake, do the right things just for five more days, and you've done the job. And again, won the toss, which wasn't a bad thing. I mean, I had a, a run in India where I didn't win anything just about, or, We've managed to change that round just in time for Australia. Won the toss, elected to bat, which was the, the only sensible thing to do. And we had a marvellous first day. Half century for David Gower. Already seen good touch. 50 from 64 balls, seven boundaries. It's his 26th half century and he's hit 1100s as well. And he's having a terrific season against the Australians. Well placed. Perfectly positioned for the stroke. And he hit it with precision straight between the two men on the offside. Graham Gooch goes to 52. Gilbert to Gower. Lovely forcing shot of the back foot by Gower for four. Gower at his very best there. Been lucky so many times uh, with the weather here for the start of the Oval Test. It's another lovely day. Sort of day that uh, everybody's been waiting for for such a long time. And it and to Gooch. That's the short one that uh, Gooch has been waiting for. He makes no mistake again. Placed it uh, ideally there between cover and backup point for four. And Dave Gilbert gets a break at this pavilion end. And Jeff Lawson comes to take over. The stroke lent into that again, stroked it through the offside for four more. And again, that brings the uh, two batsmen level, both on 72.
Bennett to Gower. That's safe. McDermott the fielder, three more to Gower. Wild throw from McDermott and 2,000 runs in Test cricket against Australia for David Gower. Not many people have done that. Alan Border using this 15-minute period himself and Murray Bennett to give his quick bowlers an extra rest. But his accuracy's all awry. And that's 100 for David Gower. Another test match century for the England captain. And life is pretty good for him at the moment. Full pitch, and that's just what Graham Gooch wanted, because that will surely take him to 100. No problem at all, it's over the ropes now. And a great relief for Graham Gooch. Long wait to make his first 100 against Australia. Something of a mystery that it hasn't happened before. But he finally goes to 101 out of 227 for one. 194 balls, 13 fours. His fifth test 100 in all, but as we've already said many times, this is his first against Australia. Dermot again. Driven back beautifully again through the covers. No need for anybody to move there. Four runs. So McDermott can't get it right. Now the half follies are too short. That's a very good shot. Uh, he's done that extremely well. And that's an improvised stroke. Nonetheless, it went very quickly. Fortunately, uh, this is not the weather for log fires. Lawson now preparing to come in from the pavilion end to 88 for one and Gow's on 129. Good shot. has fixed all that. Bun it again. Well, that's a short one which you can't bowl the gooch. 140 out on the board, it's four more. 320 up, and that means a 300 partnership. Golden days for English cricket this summer. Lawson then continues around the wicket. Gooch on one four seven. Well, another fine shot. Excellent way to go through to a, a one fifty. Hundred and fifty one for Graham Gooch. Those runs coming out of a total of three hundred and twenty eight for one.
Gilbert together. Oh, a cracking shot. They are enjoying that, as indeed the crowd have. So he too goes on to another landmark, 151. Out of a 349 for one score. Got him. Cold court. Murray Bennett. I think it needed two goes to grab it. What a marvellous innings from David Gar. Fully appreciated by the capacity crowd here at the Oval today. A delightful exhibition. And this is how it all ended. Ball played very firmly into the gully. Murray Bennett, a specialist gully fieldsman, taking at least two attempts to gather it safely. 89 overs have gone. Last one coming up now, and Murray Bennett to bowl it, and to bowl it to Gatting. And he's caught him. With some hesitation, Border has given Bennett his first test wicket in England. Border diving forward to take the catch. And Gatting just waiting to check with Border that had been caught above the ground. Feet up in the dressing room the first night? Um, very pleasant, very pleasant indeed. It was a healthy position to be in, so 300 odd for one. We'd obviously scored very quickly again, which uh, is all to the good. I mean, look back, you look back on the game and you see the next morning's collapse and you think, well, you know, I'm very, very glad indeed that things went, went so well on the first day. Actually, it was a pretty good effort uh, from the quicker bowlers to get through, to get through a side that uh, really had them by the throat. I thought they came back fairly well. It was a big change round, wasn't it? Certainly um, with the new ball again, they used that a bit better, I think, on the second morning than they did on the first morning. Whether that's because we batted worse, I don't know. It's always one of those things where you've got two sides trying to do the opposite. They certainly had a lot more uh, going for them on the second morning. We just didn't come to grips with it at all, which is very disappointing in some ways, but nevertheless still in a very good position. And great catch, going the wrong way. Picked it up, Gooch is gone on 196. And one for Lawson. There'll be congratulations from the team there. Dave Gilbert rushes over to say well done. And two wickets are down this morning. Alan Lum, just with the single to his name, on strike. Yes, safely pouched down at a deep long lane. Alan Lum goes. It's another wicket for Lawson. And he's out for a single, um, 418 for six. And that's edged and gone, caught behind. Good catch there by the keeper. Lawson takes another wicket on both and goes. And well done. Gilbert has his first test match wicket. And the Australians have broken through again. Downton, the one uh, batsman we've seen this morning, who, uh, as ever, has played the quickest pretty well. Faces uh, McDermott now. And he's bowling all over the place. What a great start there for McDermott. What a good delivery, too. One of the great sights for any quick bowler there. Middle stump flattened, flying out of the ground. And it's 4.52 for nine. Lawson again. And he's out this time, uh, shuffled across, got everything right in front. And I would think little doubt there, Phil Edmonds knows it. And it leaves England all out for 464. And of course, if they can bowl us out like that, it gives our bowlers the encouragement again. Ian rushed in. Um, again, we did Hilditch on the hook, this sort of thing. Everything's still going well. He did rush in, didn't he, both of them? He bowled quick with plenty of bounce. Oh, yes. I mean, that's right. He was looking forward as much as anyone. Having bowled as quickly on some of the deader wickets as anyone in, in the series. He came in on that one and really relished it. Oh, 
attack WW. Wood is gone, Bentham has broken through. 35 for one Australia. Bentham on the move again. That's hooked away, high again, Gooch is underneath it and he's gone. And would you believe the Hillditch again falls for the free card trick? Time after time, match after match, who can blame Botham for dropping it there when so many batsmen obligingly hold out for him? That's very well bowled. The top spinner coming back with the arm from outside off stump. And Vessels trying to force away on the offside. A lovely piece of bowling from off spinner John Embury. someone might hold you up or someone's going to get in and you know, stop the rot. But things just kept going. We, we managed to keep the pressure on throughout. And really, as we said, it was a very good wicket. Um, I suppose you'd, you'd assume that Australians being used to something like that in their home country would have played a bit better on it. The end of a tour, I suppose, again, they're perhaps a little weary. I was expecting certainly more resistance than, than occurred. And just kept the fingers crossed that we just keep bowling well. They wouldn't go quiet in the stage, wouldn't go flat, and that uh, we just keep falling. And could be trouble if he hits, he's got to go. Yes. Great hesitation there, and that really was thrown away. Richard came, but then that hesitated, saw Richard coming, decided to go, but if the throw was anything like good, he had to be run out. the end of the Australian innings, Gilbert plays on to both them. Richie remains 64 not out, Australia all out for 241 and David Gower has the option now of enforcing the follow-on if he so wishes. Happened to me at uh, Adelaide 9.59 and I've just uh, given a little message before I passed uh, the word on to Peter May to bat again that that was the only way England could have regained the Ashes. Now, that was quite true. Did that go through your mind at the Oval? Um, I just thought, I just, just had the feeling that having weighed up you know, all the evidence, all, all the opinions and my own feelings... Was it, a, get... was it a sixth sense that you had them by the throat and you might as well get Well, right yes, I, mean, I thought we had fresh bowlers. We'd only been bowling half a day. We had a rest day to come. Therefore, you think, well, why not? I mean, it, things are going so well. It's backing the bowlers, basically. They're doing such a great job anyway that you feel that they are down. The batsman, if I was in that position as a batsman, you know, you've got a big, long climb up to get out of the hole. And I would just fancy turning the thumb screw, you know, turning the screw yet more. And you could hardly say that it was unsuccessful. Well, that's right. I mean, again, <laughs> it was a marvellous way to finish the series from our point of view. It was a marvellous way just to complete the route, as it were, and uh, make sure that the results stood, the ashes had come back home and in the proper place. And really a tremendous effort all round. I mean, the side responded so well. Uh, it was, again, a, a marvellous team effort. We haven't said much so far in, in this talk. But everyone responded throughout the series, really. I mean, the spinners, the, the pace bowlers, the batters, the keeper. I mean, everyone's been involved at some stage or other, and they've all played their part. And then Monday morning, the icing on the cake for you. Yes, again, you, you're always looking there thinking, well, we, you know, we, we just, need, just need time to wrap it up. I had no real visions that we'd do it on that Monday morning. I thought it would be a little bit harder work than that. Gregory is gone, driving. 
A little ambitiously at Richard Ellison's away swinger. It was really quite wide, but uh, Greg Ritchie hasn't been in touch this morning, hasn't quite found the pace, and that is the breakthrough that England were after. Both of them in again. And he's gone. There's the edge. Simple, straightforward catch. To Paul Downton. Wayne Phillips has gone. Both of them have struck yet another blow. And it's 96 for six. Now the field moving. Try to keep Border down at this end. Prevent the single. And uh, he's gone. Both of them scored him. Ellison's taken another wicket. And that surely is it. Border out for 58, 114 for seven. Both are making no mistake in the slips there, as that was nudged in his direction by Border. It'll be a losing series for this man, but he's come out with it with tremendous credit. Ellison has bowled it perfectly this morning. He got border with a beautiful piece of bowling. And now Geoffrey Lawson with the outswinger that started on or just outside off stump and then kept going. It was certainly brilliant, but you can stack both of them up as two of the finest catches you'll see in uh, a whole era of Test Match cricket. Both of them has just caught McDermott off Ellison, and it's 129 for nine. Murray Bennett now having removed his dark glasses. Caught and bowled. Bennett is out. And Gilbert remains unbeaten. And England have won the test match. They have regained the Ashes. The margin in innings and 94 runs. And David Gower must be one of the happiest men in the sporting world at this moment. David, it's a funny old game, isn't it? Uh, you were swamped by the... <laughs> You were, um, you were swamped by the West. Just, just going now. <laughs> swamped by the West Indies last year. Things start tide turned in India. Uh, you were struggling to get runs in May in wet weather, and everything's gone right, hasn't it, for a long time? Well, yes. Actually, as the gentleman downstairs has just said, history <laughs> sums that up. I mean, I think we all we all know very well that this game has very many ups and downs, whether they be personal or as regards sides. And you just accept the, the good times and enjoy them. And the bad times, you just try and forget. You play through them looking for the good times again. So we're on a good time now. I'm delighted. Very, very happy indeed. And I'm just looking forward to enjoying it now for the next uh, three or four hours this afternoon somewhere. The series was a, a fantastic one. I think cricket was the winner, uh, even though England have come out 3-1 uh, on top. I think it's... Uh, it was a, a justifiable result. Uh, England started to uh, put holes in our batting over the last few test matches and uh, we succumbed to the, the pressure that they applied to us and uh, they fully deserved the 3-1 result. But it was a really great series. David, I'd like to make a little presentation to you. I have to say that it is a replica. The Ashes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it's all about. Thank you. Marvellous moment. What a pity they didn't uh, let you keep the replica. It would have been very nice. <laughs> yes, it would have been. It's, uh, it's obviously a very satisfying thing. A very so it's a job well done at the end of it. It's one of those moments which you treasure.
for a long, long time after. Whatever happens in, in days to come, years to come, it's something very pleasant to look back on. Well, it's rather nice to stand here and uh, look at the ashes for which we've fought over so many years. The bag, the velvet bag, marked 1883, the same year it was given to the Honourable Ivo Bly by Mrs Fletcher of Brisbane after uh, the Honourable Ivo Bly's team had defeated Billy Murdoch's side 2-1 to one in Australia. And we've gone on 102 years now. What sort of a summer did you have? A good one. Very, very pleasant indeed. Enjoyed it a lot. And the great moments? That's got to be the greatest of them. That's obviously, as I say, it's the job well done. It's the culmination of three months' hard work. And we've been all been through it before where it's not worked quite as well. When it goes that way, when things go right, when you make runs yourself, that's the time to be pleased.